so uh, these are a couple of tough, uh, tough talks to follow in. Made me cry. Did you make anybody else cry? And uh, the show made you laugh. So uh, I'm not going to make you cry. I'm probably not going to make you laugh. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by making you wince. How about that? I'm going to say some four-letter words at you. Ready? Test. Quiz. Exam. Okay? They do this instinctively make you cringe a little. I mean, there's certainly words that make most students anxious. There are words that actually make a lot of teachers anxious. And my guess is if you think back to your own school days, there are words that probably conjure up a lot more negative feelings and memories than they do positive, right? Well, the reason why is because I think most of us have experienced testing in its most common form, or more specifically for its most common purpose, which is namely to evaluate learning, to know what you know. Right? Now, assessing learning via testing in and of itself isn't so bad. It's that they're almost always high stakes tests. That is, there are very real consequences of the outcomes of these tests for students and increasingly for teachers. So since No Child Left Behind was put in place, there's been an increase in the amount of high-stakes testing. And with that, there's been an increase in the debate about whether these high-stakes tests are good or bad, or both. Right? What parts, what purpose do they serve to enhance education? Now, with that said, I'm not going to be arguing for or against high-stakes assessment tests today. What I'm going to be arguing for is another very important purpose that tests can play in education, namely as a way to enhance learning. Tests actually can promote learning. Now this is what I uh, suspect is unexpected, is surprising to most of you, certainly to most students. That is, if you ask students, they'll tell you, well, learning happens while I study. While I read my textbook, while I go over my, my lecture notes, while I study. And if I self-test, it's just to figure out what I know. So the idea here is that the, the assumption is that tests are completely inert for learning and memory. They're just to figure out how much we have. They don't change what we have. But in fact, learn, uh, taking tests does change what you know. It changes what you've learned. It changes the likelihood you'll remember something later. So, if that is surprising to you, you might be asking me, well, what kind of evidence do you have to back up that claim? Here's some. <laughs> so, there's actually, this isn't all, this is part of a hundred years of research in cognitive psychology. More than 150 published papers, more than 300 published experiments that have shown test-enhanced learning. Now, I, obviously, I don't have time to go over 100 years of research with you today, so I'm going to show you three. I'm a scientist. I show, I'll show you data. That's what I do. I'm going to show you three illustrative studies from the literature to give you a sense of test-enhanced learning. Okay? So the first study, uh, uh, Jeff Karpicki at Purdue <coughs> University did this one, and it's relatively straightforward. He had college students come to the lab, and he asked them to learn 60 Swahili English word pairs. So foreign language is one of the things that most students are uh, expected to learn in a liberal arts education. He picked Swahili because for experimental purposes, you can't teach a student a language they already know. You've got to pick something they don't know. Right? So here's a sample item. Zabibu is Swahili for grapes. <clears throat> okay, so everybody's going to start out with some initial study. So you'll see these 60 word pairs one at a time, so you'd see fumbi dust, you'd see that for a few seconds to study, and then you'd see the next item to study, you'd see the next one, and so on, until you got through all 60 items, okay? Now, here's where the fun happens. Here's the action. Half of these students randomly assigned to get to study that list of 60 word pairs four more times, okay? The other half of the students instead only got to restudy the list twice and instead they traded in those other two restudy opportunities for practice tests so here's how it worked for the practice test group they would see oh sorry there you go for the practice test group they'd see a swahili word they'd be given a few seconds to try to come up with its meaning or its translation they'd be moved on to the next one and the next one and so on and 
until they had been tested on all 60. Then they got to study them. And then they got tested again. They got to study them again. Okay, everybody see how that works? Okay, now here's the idea. If learning happens during study, if tests are inert, one of these groups got to re-study four times. The other group only got to study twice. So we already know who should be doing better here, right? Who should have better memory? Well, let's find out. So Jeff gave them all, after a short while after learning, he gave them all a final test. And again, it was like the one I showed you. I'm going to give you Swahili words. You try to come up with the English translations. So here's how they did. And for starters, I'm just showing you the group that got to re-study four times. And this is the percent of those English translations that they correctly recalled. And they're not doing badly. They could remember about 60% of them. That's not shabby, right? What about the group that got gypped, that got cheated out of two of those study opportunities? Considerably better. Almost perfect memory for trading in two of those study trials for two practice tests instead. And this is actually a very common finding in the literature that tests can be more effective than study. So you might be saying, well, that's all well and good. They're college students. They're smart kids. What about other kinds of learners? Maybe you say, what about younger learners? Well, here's a study uh, by Doug Rowe and his colleagues at University of South Florida who work with fourth graders. And what's the kind of stuff that fourth graders are asked to learn? Well, how about maps, map learning? Now again, you've got to teach kids something they don't already know for experimental purposes. So he gave them a fictional map with 10 region names. It actually looked like this. Okay? So map, here's 10 region names. I want the kids to learn to identify these regions. It's like learning to identify countries and states and so on. So every, all the kids got initial study to become familiar with the map and the regions. And then again, here's the action. Half of the kids got to restudy the map over and over and over and over again. And the other group instead spent most of their time doing practice testing. So here's how it worked. For the study group, they'd see the map, they'd see one region name, they'd see it for six seconds, and then they'd see the next one for six seconds, and so on until you got to restudy all the region names, and they actually got to go through that five times. The other group, instead, they saw one region name at a time, but at the top of the screen, and they had to try to remember which region was this. They did get shown the answer, but only for two seconds. So again, you're either getting to restudy for six seconds every time, or only two seconds every time. Okay. Now, one day later, all the kids are given a final test to see what they learned, to see what they remember. And the first test was, here's a blank map. I want you to write in as many of those region names as you can remember. Then they take that one away. They give them a new one. They say, OK, here's another blank map. But here's the 10 names now, and you have to match them to the right regions. OK, so two tests here. Well, how do the students do? Once again, this is the percent they got right. And recall on the left, matching on the right. And the most important thing is the yellow bars are bigger than the blue bars. Spending time testing was more effective than spending all your time studying. Okay. Okay. So the third example, last one I'll give you. This is a fun one. I picked it because I like it. It's fun. Is anybody a birder? Anybody keep a life list? Do birding? It's a great hobby. It's one, actually, it's one of the fastest growing hobbies in the country. I highly recommend you pick it up. Take it up if you haven't. It's fun. Uh, this work by uh, Larry Jacoby and his colleagues at Washington University is building birders. He's turning kids into birders. And what he did, he's again college students, and he showed them 60 pictures of different birds with their family names. Okay? And in particular, they were uh, 12 different bird families, and you saw five different uh, in each family. So you have five different sparrows, five different warblers, five different thrashers, and so on. Okay? And your job was to learn to identify birds. So you might see this picture and be told, this is a sparrow. Then you'd be told, this is a warbler. Here's a swallow, and so on. Okay. Okay. So once again, everybody gets initial study. In fact, they get to go through the, the picture name pairs three times. Okay. And then again, the action happens. What's the action? Well, half of the students, again, randomly assigned, they get to restudy those picture name pairs three more times. The other half, that's it. 
No more study for you. Instead, you're going to take three practice tests. Okay? And in fact, they looked like this. So if you restudy, it's like, here's that sparrow again, right? Study it. But in the test group, you see the pictures, but you have to try to identify the bird. Practice. Okay. One day later, everybody takes a final test. Let's see how good of a birder you are. Let's see what kind of bird identification skills you have. And what you're going to see are pictures of birds. Now, 60 of those are going to be the same birds I showed you during learning. That's what I'm calling the old birds, the ones you saw before. You're also going to see 60 new ones that I didn't show you. And let's see how good of a birder you are. So, here's an old bird. Anybody remember what it is? Swallow, right? This one I didn't show you, but it is from one of the families. This is a new bird. It's a warbler. <laughs> okay. Here, for starters, is how good of a, a birder you are after restudying versus testing for the old birds, the ones you saw, right? But you might be saying, well, that's not really bird identification. That's just, I just have memory for you told me that one was a sparrow, right? Well, the new birds are the ones that tell us, did you really learn something about these bird families? And the answer is yes, and the answer is you learned it better from practice testing than you did from more restudy. Now, the last question you might have here is, those are all well and good, they're lab studies with simple materials, does this really work in the wild? Right? Can this really help students do better in their classes, learn more, learn it better, remember it longer? The answer is yes. Now, for sake of time, I'm going to spare you the nitty-gritty details of the methodologies, and I just want to show you two um, uh, promising sets of results here. Okay? Now, the first one comes from research we've been doing at uh, Kent State, my lab, and it involved working with one of our college instructors who teaches introductory psychology. She gave us her core concepts, her key content, and we split it into two sets. And then we got her students to come in, and for half of the stuff they had to learn, we helped them engage in practice testing via a computerized study buddy. It was like virtual flashcards. That's all it was. And the other half, they had to learn for their class. They learned it however they learned it. We left them to their own devices for that content. Okay. Now, the fun is we got permission to uh, access their course exams. So after the fact, we looked at their course exam performance for how they did for the concepts that they engaged in practice testing versus the concepts they were left to their own devices? The answer, more than a letter grade improvement from simple practice testing in the study buddy. Now, 71% when left to their own devices, what are their own devices? What do students typically do? What students typically do is cram the night before, mostly via just studying stuff over again, right? Passive restudy of notes and textbooks. And that's actually okay. You can squeak by on an exam. Not too bad, see? But the problem is it's very bad for long-term retention. And that's the concern that students forget most of what they've learned shortly after they take the test. Well, the good news is that's another big benefit of practice testing is it's particularly good for enhancing durable learning. Long-term learning, you're going to keep what you got. So with these students, we followed up with them three weeks later. <laughs> Maybe we did. Uh, we did follow up with them three weeks later, and we gave them a surprise final test. And we, uh, we said, now we just want to see how many of those concepts you remember, and we made them do it the hard way. What was this concept? Come up with the meaning, come up with the definition. And I wish I could get that. There we go. And look, they retained most of what they learned. If they engaged in practice testing, they remembered almost nothing of what they had learned if they had. The last example here is a, is a, it's a fun one because it's the quick and dirty what can teachers do in their classes. Well, it, every test doesn't have to be high stakes. And in this study, they a simple study, they just had two sections of a course. It was a child development course. And in one section, one time a week, the students took a short, low stakes quiz. And in the other section, they didn't. Significant improvement on course exam performance from one short, low-stakes quiz per week in the course. Okay, wrap up here. I'm actually going to start with a disclaimer. 
I am arguing that practice testing is a very good tool for a student to have in their toolbox when it comes to enhancing learning, enhancing memory. I'm not saying it's the only tool. There are other effective study strategies, and this is not the panacea that's going to cure all of our educational woes, right? I'm not saying that. But I am saying it is a tool that should be in the toolbox. It is highly effective. It works for learners of all different ages. Test-enhanced learning has been shown in preschoolers. It's been shown in older adults with Alzheimer's. It works for all kinds of information, from those simple word pairs I showed you, to visual spatial information, to complex text material. It holds up over long retention intervals, and you can enhance performance on many different kinds of tests. There is no more robust potent strategy for memory and learning known in the literature today. And, as I say, it is easy to do, relatively easy. Students can engage in practice testing on their own, just via simple flashcards, right, or doing practice tests that come with their instructional materials. Teachers can do it, incorporate low-stakes quizzing into the classroom more frequently than is currently done. And parents can even engage in informal practice testing with their kids just by doing simple informal quizzes, right? Small, short, every so often, it helps. So to wrap up, here is my take-home message. I hope I have convinced you that testing, in fact, can be a very good friend 